My first impression of Francis Bacon was seeing a show at Claude Bernard in 1977 in Rue des Beaux-Arts. And at that exhibition, it was the first show I'd ever seen just of Francis's work. And I was convinced at that moment that he was one of the greatest image makers of the latter part of the 20th century. And after that, did you have a yearning to meet him personally? I felt that one day I would meet him, for sure. But I was particularly interested in meeting Muriel Belcher. And I was very fortunate that um, just by chance I saw the club. I was on my way to the British Museum one Tuesday afternoon. And I saw a sign and um, just walked in. And the first person I saw was as the door opened was Francis, which was quite extraordinary. And to my left, there was an elderly lady who said, oh, hello, dearie, how are you? And I said, I'm very well, thank you. And we, we just had a chat. And Francis came over and offered to buy me a drink. Ian came over and said, tell me, young man, are you a member? And this elderly lady on my left, she just grabbed my sleeve and she tugged at it. And she said, say yes, dearie, say yes. And I said, no, I'm not a member, but I'd like to become one. And so Ian said, um, no, I'm sorry, young man, you can't, you can't just come in here and, um, and become a member. He said, you have to have someone to propose you. So I said, well, maybe this lady might be so good as to <laughs> propose me. I didn't realize it was Muriel. And <coughs> Ian said, you can't just come in here and do that. You said, you need two people to propose you. So I said, well, perhaps Mr. Bacon might be so good as to propose me, and then I'll have my two proposers. So Ian said, no, he said, I'm afraid you can't do that. He said, do you know the door that you came in by? And I said, yes. And he said, would you kindly leave by it? So I left. And it was just as I was leaving, walking down the stairs, the green suddenly struck me. And the image I had in my mind of the person I was speaking to, um, that that was Muriel. And so I left it for a few days and then came back. And Ian was... Um, less, I don't know how to, he, he was less nervous and I, I realised the reason he was nervous was because Muriel was in the club and Francis was there because at that time Muriel was not very well and it was only occasionally that she would be in the club and so he had to follow the appropriate protocol in terms of per people coming in. Ian, uh, Ian Board was Muriel's barman and business partner and as he said to me and to a number of people that Muriel was one of two people who had magic, he felt, in who he'd met in his lifetime, and the other one was Francis, and he said that Muriel rescued him from the gutter. Anyway, he, he said that um, he would take me to see Muriel the next day. This was the Saturday when I went in to, to apologise for sort of turning up unannounced that time, and... We met the next day and he took me to meet Muriel in Shelton Street. That was her flat? Yes. She was in Wellington Court. Why were you particularly interested in meeting Muriel at that time? I'd read an article by Dan Farson and she sounded an extraordinary person. The club sounded as though it was an extraordinary place and I just felt that um, I might fit in there somehow as an outsider. And, um, and you say that Francis was very friendly when you first saw him, which you could need... Very voice. much so, yes. yes. Could you tell us a bit more about that, the feeling you got from him? I was just quite astonished, you know, to walk in and find that Francis was there, because he used to frequent the club a lot, but it was not every single day and not all of the day that he was there, because he used to travel a lot and he worked a lot. Did you become a regular of the colony? We well, from, the, from that moment, going round to see Muriel, um, one, of, one of the things that Francis said was that one of the most difficult things for an artist was to have a subject. And I knew when I met Muriel that I then had a subject. And uh, Ian said, you know where the club is now. And he said, you're very welcome to come in any time you want which I did do from time to time, and I would go round and see Muriel. Susan and I would visit Muriel, and Sue would do some cooking for Muriel, and I would sit and chat to her. And on one occasion I said to her, oh Muriel, it's um, quite extraordinary that so many 
amazing people have come to the club. Alberto Giacometti, Francis Bacon, um, Frank Auerbach, Michael Andrews, Lucian Freud. I said, what do you think it was that drew them to the club? She said, I think it's my charm, dear. I think it's my charm. When I've, I visited Francis on many occasions at Rees Mews, and there was one time when I had a sitting with him there, and after we'd been in the studio, we went in the sitting room, and he brought in a whole series of photographs of Muriel taken by John Deakin, and he just let me look through this series of photographs which he'd used for various paintings of her, and he said, he, he pronounced her name Muriel, and he said she had the most extraordinary beauty. There was one occasion specifically in relationship to Muriel was one afternoon, it was probably about five to three, I'd gone in early to, to see Ian at the club and Francis came in and he was in a particularly elated mood and that was normally when he'd been gambling and things had worked out but on this occasion he, he walked in and he went over to the far right hand corner and he said... I've just finished a painting, it's called The Sphinx, and the extraordinary thing about it is it looks very much like Muriel. And did Francis ever see your work? I never showed him anything, but I know that Valerie had showed him work. I never asked. Maybe I should have done, but I, I think that the fact that he let me visit him whenever I wanted and do the series of portraits of him that um, it would be okay. Yeah. Um, and in the portraits and drawings you did of him, um, you did that presumably from photographs? I did them from photographs, I did them from video, I did from observation. My job was to observe him and I continued to do so in a variety of different um, venues in his studio, in his sitting room, in restaurants, in Paris, in London, in the Colony Room Club, drunk and sober. And I always remember that Ian said, Ian Board said that Francis had said that tears should always be reserved for the bedroom. But on one occasion, Francis came in and he asked how Muriel was, and Ian said, how ill she was and Francis said well he'd spoken to her on the phone and she seemed to be okay and Ian said well of course she pulls herself together when she needs to speak to you and she loves to speak to you but he said she's not very well at all and Ian explained how ill she was and Francis wept. It was the only time I saw him cry. I saw him laugh a lot. I did a, a whole series of portraits of, of Muriel I spent quite a long time in Shelton Street with her. She was in bed at the time and um, we, we just talked and I made a series of drawings and took a series of photographs. The drawings, two of them I gave to Miss Beston as a thank you because I used them to make a, a painting and Vary said that she would have it photographed for me, which she did. She sent it to Prudence Cumming Associates and Keith photographed it. I always knew Miss Beston as Valerie and there were very few people who called her Valerie. And she was very kind to me and she supported me and supported my work. Through the, the images I made of Muriel, Valerie suggested I do a portrait of Francis and so um, she said just give Francis a call, which I did do. And Francis said, of course, Michael, just come round. He said, how about next week? And I went round early one morning and we had a chat and we arranged to have a series of sittings. And Francis said, you know where I live, you can come round it whenever you want. And so I didn't pester him, but um, I went to see him from time to time in the studio so I could make a series of portraits of him and a series of portraits of the studio, essentially to do with the notion of the presence of absence and the absence of, of presence. Some years after Francis's death, I had an opportunity to use 
a medium I'd never used before in this particular form. Um, it was suggested I could make a portrait maybe in diamonds and I was somewhat reluctant to do that initially but did actually realise that it's only the same as I'd been doing before but it's a different form of carbon and so I was given an opportunity to make an image called Every Man and Every Woman is a Star which is a double-sided portrait of Francis made out of 4,802 tiny diamonds. Um, were you friends with John Edwards? Oh, very much so, yes. And you like I like John a lot, yes. John was very kind to Susan and myself, both John and Philip, and invited us to go and stay with them in, in the country. And there was one occasion in the club which it's, it still sticks in my mind, which I think, again, was really extraordinary, was that John was to my left and Francis was to my right and John was talking to somebody and Francis... I sensed he felt out of the conversation and he leaned over across me and put his arm across and he felt John's jacket, he felt his collar and then he rubbed rather affectionately his his shoulder and down his arm. John was wearing a, a corduroy jacket and Francis said, you can give me your jacket when you finish with it because I'll use it for my paintings. And I thought that that was something, it's already been documented, I know, I know of that, but it was something for me extraordinary to hear Francis saying that, particularly in relationship to notions of um, symp sympathetic magic. There was something that Francis said, he said we were on the way to Wheeler's and it was um, for supper and he said j'observe le tout which I thought is something which I, I always remember. It's not everything, it's more to do with everything. How would you read that again? It's to do with the way I take it. It's to do with everything universally as opposed to just looking at everything, it's listening, it's smelling, it's reading, etc. There was something, um, Francis, the way he used to dress, he would wear a, a leather blouse on, um, zilly, made in France, and he was quite partial to very good quality leather and suede blues on, and on the inside, on the left hand side, he would use a very small safety pin and he would use a small safety pin when he put his money in there when he was going gambling because he had it sealed he'd get it from the bank and it'd be sealed in polythene of high denomination notes and I suppose once a thief he'd know about how thieving went on and so he had it fastened onto the inside of his blues on and what interested me was the use of the safety pin because its historical precedent goes back to the Picasso study for a crucifixion, one of the drawings, and then of course through to the head, which I think is in the Ulster Museum, which Francis used the safety pin in the background in the curtain, and then on to him using it for some of his own images, as well as using it for him to put into... To, to hold his money in place, but he used one, I think it's a safety pin between two photographs to hold them together. And so it has quite an interesting link to his life and the art. Someone said to Francis once, she said, um, oh Francis, do you keep a diary? And he said, why bother? He said, I simply paint my life. I think I was very fortunate. I had an opportunity to go to, um, Reese Muse and Francis said after the first time, after the second time I'd been there, he said, "You know where I live. Come round whenever you want." And there were different kind of levels, I think, of um, people being accepted in Reese Muse, and I was very fortunate to be allowed not just into the apartment but also into the studio and be in the studio and see paintings that were in progress. One in particular was one with the orange background of a chicken that was just hanging. And 
Francis and I were talking, and as I, I looked down, I saw a frying pan, and it was full of orange pigment. And Francis looked at me and he said, because he realised what I was looking at, and he said, oh, um, I said, pastel, it's for the backgrounds. And I was actually thinking at the time that thing that Degas said about, oh, a little cuisine, because of the chicken and then because of the, the frying pan. And so Francis said, oh, it's the, the pastel. So I said to Francis, even though he'd given me access to see this, these images and be in the studio, I said to him, because I felt I'd, I wouldn't get an answer, but I had to ask. I said, uh, oh, how do you fix the pastel, Francis? Francis? And Francis, <coughs> in the usual manner. So he wasn't going to give anything away about that. But then after that, we, we had lunch. He, he made lunch for me in, in his kitchen, which also had a bath in it, as you know. And um, he said, he pulled a piece of paper out, and he said that he'd been been sent this and he said um, lies if you like but lies that are more truthful than the literal truth and it was a quote from Van Gogh and he said did you know that and I did know it and I said yes and then he spoke about um, oh, I asked him if there were any paintings he particularly liked of his own and he said there was one he said of Isabel and I just said oh the blue one in Berlin and he looked kind of shocked and said, yes. He said, I'm very fond of that one. And he said, you know it? And I said, of course. I said, I went to Berlin specifically to see it. And then we spoke about um, painting and he spoke about what Michel Leris had said to him. And he said that Michel Leris said that with Picasso, he said Picasso just threw everything into a bulldozer and mixed it up and then what came out was a Picasso. In a way, it was kind of giving me tuition about how maybe one one did things. Yes, it was something that um, impressions of people, and in particular Francis, that he was many faceted because one reads and one speaks and one sees on film with interviews of people, and he's different to as many different people who've ever met him, and so in that way he was multifaceted, and there was a a situation once where I was with Francis and Ian in the club and it was quite late and Francis asked Ian for a comb and he took the comb and went and stood by his favourite mirror which was above the mantelpiece and Ian left the room and it was very strange for Ian just to leave the room and Ian left the room it was as though he felt that there was something that Francis was going to say to me and Francis looked in the mirror and he checked that I was watching him, which I was, and then he started to arrange his hair and he started to work quite fastidiously bringing the hair down to create a sort of kiss curl. I think Michel Leris had spoken about the way that he did his hair and it was on his forehead like a punctuation mark. And he made it into a shape that looked exactly like a question mark and it just struck me as being quite extraordinary because it reminded me again of the Ulster portrait where the ear has turned into a question mark and then by implication in terms of joining the dots it becomes the constellation of the great bear. And I thought about that as Francis was doing it and then he turned round and he spoke but it was as though it was a soliloquy and he said, there's Suzanne and then there's Bacon. And that was the only time I ever heard him refer to himself as Bacon. <laughs>